All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to be starting our first afternoon session with a couple of science talks. My name is Jackie Linskis. I'm chairing this session. Um, our first speaker is Bridget Stitchbury from York University in Toronto. You've already been introduced to Bridget this morning at the round table, which was awesome. Um, Bridget's a professor in the Department of Biology at York. She's also a Canada Research Chair, a very prestigious position in Canada, in ecology and conservation. And as you know, she works on migratory birds, and she uh, is a passionate conservation biologist and an ecologist studying um, migratory birds. And I first met Bridget um, earlier this year in May. We were both speakers at uh, the University of Guelph for the Canadian Society of Zoologists meeting, and it was a great pleasure to learn about her work and hear what she does, and I'm uh, pleased to present her to you today. Thank you so much. Um, the topic uh, for today, for, for my talk, is um, conservation triage. Uh, and this is a topic that I've developed a really strong interest in because of my role with Wildlife Preservation Canada, who's a sponsor, one of the sponsors of the, uh, this meeting. Um, Wildlife Preservation Canada, I'll explain in a minute, um, specializes on captive breeding, translocations, reintroductions, uh, the kinds of uh, conservation activities that, that prevent species from going extinct in the first place. Uh, and in the course of this work with the Wildlife Preservation Canada, the whole question of conservation triage has come up. What is it? What does it really mean? And should we be uh, practicing this in, in our own work? Um, <clears throat> so what I'm really interested in talking about today, I'm going to be stepping outside my comfort zone just a little bit in the sense of being a scientist who's talking to you about metaphors. We all know what metaphors are because I just used one. Um, but I'm going to try to shed some light on the subject of endangered species. Um, maybe we're going to, in this meeting, we're going to create a roadmap for change. You see what I'm doing here? <coughs> we, we can think of extinction as a train wreck. And, uh, perhaps my ideas will be shot down at the end of this talk. <coughs> These kinds of metaphors uh, are really important because they're used in communication uh, in many ways the same way that birds communicate with each other. The purpose of animal communication is to manipulate the receiver, and that's how communication evolves, and that's how our communication evolved as well. And uh, I'm not a linguist, so I'm a card-carrying scientist, but metaphors work because they manipulate the emotions, reactions, feelings, and values of the listener. That's why I'm interested in the subject of these medical metaphors and conservation. Uh, and I'm taking this opportunity just to explore this a little bit more. Uh, triage uh, comes from the word uh, trier, or to sort in French. Uh, it's typically used in the medical community uh, to refer quite simply to, to assigning order of treatment. And so you can actually buy you know, emer emergency um, personnel, have triage tags, triage tape, triage blankets. And uh, you get sorted in terms of are you going to be seen first, second, or third, and this is based on the severity of your injuries. Um, the word triage, of course, is being borrowed by conservation. We, that's what we're talking about today. But it's also being borrowed by other fields, other disciplines, to refer to this process of sorting and prioritization. Uh, so there's a thing called triage engineering. There's business triage. So conservation <coughs> biologists are not the only ones that have, have borrowed this term. Of course, we know what medical triage is, and it, it's really the process by, uh, that has a number of um, built-in features. One of them is, that, first of all, that there's insufficient capacity to treat all the patients. So we talked about that this morning a bit and elsewhere in this conference, that, that we need more money to do the job properly. But we don't have that money yet, and so by definition, uh, capacity is limited. Some patients are in a critical state and will die unless treated immediately. And certainly in, in the conservation field, we can see those um, analogies with in, in, uh, species that are on the verge of extinction. And thirdly, that there's a wide variation in the condition of patients and the likely outcome of the treatment. And that's certainly true uh, when it comes to conservation as well. So in this sense, it would seem that it would make sense to use the term triage to describe what we need to do in conservation and what been, has been raised so many times in this um, symposium. How do we decide which species we should focus our efforts on, and how do we make those decisions? And in the broadest sense, that's how we use the term triage, is, is trying to decide order of treatment and level of investment, type of treatment for each species. 
So just for example, if we look at the, uh, some IUCN data um, to say, well, how many casualties are there? Well, we know that there's uh, thousands of species just amongst animals that are listed as endangered and threatened. So this shows the percentage of all mammals that are critically <coughs> endangered or uh, endangered. It's about 10%. With birds, about 8%, amphibians, almost 20%. Uh, when you add up the numbers of patients, if we're using those medical metaphors, uh, certainly um, we have a situation where our capacity is very limited and the number of patients is enormous. Um, also, there's a great variety in terms of the type of treatment and need amongst these different patients. So obviously we need to prioritize conservation efforts. So I'm, I'm not standing here today suggesting otherwise. We need some way to prioritize which species uh, get treated first. Um, as I said, I, I'm here partly representing Wildlife Preservation Canada. We also use medical metaphors and how we communicate our mission, uh, how we talk to, about our mission to each other and also to the general public. In our case, our medical metaphor is um, the intensive care program. We call ourselves Canada's intensive care program for species at risk because we specialize on those kinds of treatments that we refer to as intensive care, captive breeding, translocations, uh, reintroduction, art artificially incubation, incubating bird and turtle eggs, and um, mitigating uh, pollution. <coughs> Um, we as an organization do practice a very simple level of triage in our conservation programs. We both lead uh, conservation efforts ourselves, but we also have a conservation grant program where we fund other researchers uh, and programs that are doing this kind of uh, specialized work. And our conservation program has grown from working with only five species a few years ago uh, to almost 20 species uh, as of next year. And this is a concerted strategy on our part to increase the number of species that we're helping because of course the, the need and the demand is out there unfortunately. So how do we go about choosing which species we're gonna support? Uh, again, very, very simple system. We use a simple triage approach just like the one I showed you at the beginning. Uh, rank one, two, three, endangered species go first, threatened species go second, and the third priority are species that are maybe special risk or they're threatened, but we need more research to figure out just exactly how to implement this kind of work. So in this sense, it is a very, very simple uh, sorting process. Um, again, whether the word triage should be used in terms of the medical <coughs> reference is really what I'm interested in here, but we certainly do sorting and prioritization. Uh, the kinds of species that we're working with are highly varied. There's been a lot of talk about charismatic or megafauna and cute animals. We do not practice triage along these lines. Uh, we don't care if it's a bumblebee or a, a butterfly or a, a frog or a bird. Um, the, it's the need of the organism that really uh, drives our decision. So again, very simple triage process. Uh, in a way, you might consider this to be a little bit naive because at some point um, we do have to evaluate uh, the, the potential success of these programs and if there will come a time very soon where our capacity to fund these projects becomes limited by income. And so uh, that's my interest here is figuring out how are we going to practice triage when we get to that point. And so far we, we haven't hit that point yet. Um, the kinds of work that we do involve, as I said, uh, head starting programs with turtles, um, captive breeding with things like burrowing owls and eastern loggerhead shrike, translocation projects with the Orange Kangaroo Rat in Alberta. And one of the important points that I'll bring up again um, towards the end of my talk is that in most of these projects involve determination of best practice as well as implementation of recovery. And I just wanted you to hold that thought because um, I'll bring it up again at the end that there's a lot of important work that needs still to be done to figure out what's the probability of these kinds of recovery programs succeeding and what is the most efficient, effective, cost-effective, economically effective way to go about this kind of recovery. Well, a lot of these species that, that I've been talking about um, run into this problem of conservation triage because of the huge economic costs of doing captive breeding, translocations, reintroductions, and this sort of thing. And really the, the best way to sort of capture the spirit of conservation triage is to use the example of the poor California condor, who on the one hand uh, could be touted as a success story for conservation and these kinds of captive breeding programs because back in 1982 there were less than 25 individuals uh, in the world, and as of today, we have something like 400 condors alive and 
not so well, but alive, uh, and about half of those are free flying. Uh, the problem with California condors is that a large uh, portion of them are lead poisoned because their environment still contains large amounts of lead. And despite the success of the captive breeding, um, these wild populations are not self-sustaining. One, because they can't reproduce properly in the wild because of lead poisoning. And secondly, because these adults uh, have to be recaptured for lead chelation therapy. So when they, uh, all of the birds are radio tagged and followed, and on a regular basis, birds have, to, have already been released, have to be recaptured, treated for lead poisoning, and then re-released again. And so this population is not self-sustaining. Uh, and is what we call conservation reliant. So yes, in the terms of triage, and here it made up a little triage tag for the poor condor, how do we decide um, what circle to, to um, designate, you know, what to designate the status in terms of triage for this particular species? And it's not so straightforward. If we just look at the biology, strictly the biology of it, um, this bird uh, species clearly needs immediate care, otherwise it will die. In other words, it will go extinct. If we withdraw the captive breeding program, if we withdraw the lead chelation treatment of these birds, um, there's no doubt that they will go extinct in the next 30 or 40 years. And so in one sense, the triage tag should say immediate care. <laughs> Uh, and this is where the, the, the modern term or the, the current term of the use conservation triage comes in. It's not necessarily just about biology, it's now about economics. The California condor program costs roughly about $5 million per year, and this species will be conservation reliant for the foreseeable future. Who knows how long, at least 10 or 20 years, we'll be looking at spending $5 million a year. And the question has been posed, is it worth it? Should we pay that amount of money to save the California condor. Um, and we face trade-offs in terms of uh, resource allocation. Like it or not, there's not enough money in the pot yet. And so should we take this $5 million and spend it on other species? What is the correct decision here? And this is where um, this conservation triage is being likened to battlefield triage in the sense that in battlefield situations or mass bombing kind of situations, there's just not enough resources to save everybody. And this is really where uh, conservation triage borrows its medical metaphor most strongly is in this battlefield scenario where doctors have to face the decision of letting patients die in order to save other patients. And that's exactly how conservation triage uses the term, letting some species go extinct in order to save other species. <coughs> Um, we are facing these kinds of issues um, at Wildlife Preservation Canada and, and in southern Ontario. A less well-known example is the Eastern Loggerhead Shrike, which there's a, a nice display at the back if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, the Eastern Loggerhead Shrike is a species that's undergoing severe declines, lost about 90% of its population since the 1960s. It's a subspecies of the Loggerhead Shrike. Nobody really knows why this species is disappearing, so we don't really have a quick fix for it. <coughs> A uh, captive breeding program was started in, in uh, the early 2000s um, through uh, getting wild birds, of course, and breeding them in captivity and letting the young birds go. And during the first years of this captive <coughs> breeding program, we had a dramatic increase in population size. What I'm showing on the graph here in the dark circles is the total number of breeding pairs in Ontario. And in white numbers, the number of breeding pairs we would have if none of them had been captive bred so we get this recruitment, it's a migratory species, and the young birds that we release migrate and then come back and recruit into the breeding population. So only a small percentage of the ones that release, around 5%, come back to recruit. But those recruited birds now represent about 20% of the wild population. So in this one sense, it's a very successful captive breeding program uh, which, against all odds, you'd think when you're dealing with migratory species and the birds you've just released disappear, but come back under, under their own wings to join the, the breeding population, um, against all odds, really, we're, we're, we're able to have successful recruitment into the wild. The trouble here, though, is that you can see that the actual numbers, despite this initial increase, drop back down again. Perhaps we're in a slight upturn here, but the trouble is that despite the captive breeding program, we seem to be stuck around this level of about 20 to 25 breeding pairs in Ontario, despite the fact that there's an abundance of habitat 
Breeding productivity in the wild is extremely high. Again, we don't really know why these birds are declining. The return rate of adults is really low, so the problem must be on their wintering grounds. Anyway, we have this problem with um, eastern loggerhead shrikes that maybe it is time for triage. Again, using this, uh, borrowing this term. So if our current numbers are around 20 or 25 and have been for the last time with captive breeding at its current level, we can really not expect a dramatic recovery of the population if everything else remains the same. And in fact, if we withdraw captive breeding, the population is projected to crash very quickly. So we face this real decision, not a theoretical one, a real one of should we let eastern loggerhead shrikes go extinct? Because if you remove the captive breeding, they will go extinct. And Environment Canada has made the decision to withdraw its funding from the captive breeding program. So they made that decision already. So let me talk about conservation triage and, and what it really is. Um, conservation triage is, is not a doctor at the emergency room deciding which patient gets treated first. That's not actually how it's done. The way it's used now, the way the term is used, is it's a quantitative mathematical approach to model costs and benefits. It's an economic model for return on investment. If you invest X amount of money in Y species, ABC, what will your return on investment be? It's, that's, it's not uh, what happens in the emergency room when you go there. The goal is to optimize return on investment, to do the most good with the limited resources. We all agree that this sort of efficient approach is how to best use money. But we need good data on how different conservation actions will affect the outcome of our model. So you need good data to plug in the model in order to get good decisions out of it. That's why all the scientists like to say garbage in, garbage out, which is a little bit rude, but that, that's what I'm getting at here. Here's an example of conservation triage. This is just one I got from, from a recent publication on the Sumatran tiger trying to illustrate how conservation triage works. Hugh Possingham is a big fan of this. And this is really complicated. You don't need to look at it all, but basically it's uh, modeling how many subpopulations should be managed. The more subpopulations you try to manage in terms of patrolling for poachers and, and keeping track of the individual populations, the more money it costs. So this is a, a function of how many populations you try to manage and how many will actually be saved. Low budget, medium budget, high budget. If you have a high budget, you can go for gold <coughs> and monitor, successfully monitor six populations and manage them. If you have a low budget, Trying to monitor and manage six populations is not your best solution. The optimal solution is right here. Go for three. Because you're wasting your resources trying to save six when it's not possible. My point here is it's just it's a, all it is is mathematical modeling of costs and benefits and expected returns. It has nothing to do with medicine. It's to do with the economics of how to get the best return on your investment and how to optimize your decisions. So a simple equation that might represent conservation triage, which is being presented in, in numerous review articles, uh, is that whatever score you're going to use, some kind of scoring system, each species might get a score, each subpopulation might get a score, you have to determine the value of your decision, in, in this case we'll look at it at the species level, the value of that species, the benefit of the conservation action to the species, which is normally measured in terms of recovery, how much recovery happens, and the probability of success. And you divide that by the cost. And of all these variables, the only one we really understand is the cost, because things cost money, and we're very used to, used to keeping track of exactly how much money we have spent on these different activities. What about the value? What about the benefit? What about the probability of success? When it comes to assigning a value to species, again, we've talked about this quite a lot at this symposium, how do we go about doing it? Is the cute cuddly index, is that the one where we assign value, the charismatic megafauna that are you know, maybe not so cuddly? Uh, we can use ecological terms like keystone species and umbrella species, where if you protect one species, by definition, you're protecting many, many more. They're kind of hidden behind the scenes. Uh, we could use ecological services and, and value pollinators over non-pollinators. 
Evolutionary uniqueness is another example. There's many, many different ways we can assign a value, and this is really not a scientific process in terms of deciding which one of these things we are going to value and whether we agree on that value system. So again, this is a critical variable that are plugged into these models. If you were going to ask me, Bridget, do you support the, um, allowing species to go extinct? I would say no, and so I would assign a value of one to any species that's on the brink of extinction, which means its priority would jump to the top of the line, which is in essence what we're doing. But it's a value system. In terms of measuring benefits, uh, uh, this is where I, I mentioned this earlier, um, for a lot of species at risk, we do not, we have not yet had arrived at the most efficient, most effective way of managing uh, those populations. So just one example is head starting. But there's a, a lot of discussion about just what is the best way to incubate turtle eggs in terms of um, being able to protect them from predators and then release them back into the wild. Uh, how well does this work? So just for example, in Wildlife Preservation Canada supported a project at Rondo Provincial Park, 1,435 turtle eggs were incubated, hatched, and released into the wild. But how many of those are going to recruit into the population and be breeding 10 or 15 years from now? The answer is we don't know yet. So it's hard to do the modeling because in many cases uh, there's an absence of good data. How long should the juveniles be retained if you're doing a head starting program? Should you keep those juveniles for two or three months? Six months, 12 months, 18 months? What is the best practice? The longer you keep those juveniles in captivity, the more it's going to cost. So in terms of triage and evaluating costs and benefits, there's some really important variables we don't really have a handle on yet. And in terms of beating the odds, probability of success, um, we have lots and lots of examples from conservation where species really should have gone extinct and they didn't. Uh, examples from the whooping crane, less than 25 in the wild. Uh, we talked about the California condor before, Vancouver Island marmot, less than about 30 in the wild. Now there's several hundred. Uh, probably the most extreme example, the black robin from New Zealand, one female left, and uh, now they're up to several hundred individuals. Of course, inbreeding's an issue with these, but nevertheless, <laughs> probability of success, how do you predict that? That's what goes into the model in terms of deciding who gets tre treated first. So I think I made, hopefully I made my point that triage, the way it's being done now, is not really a medical exercise. And in fact, the authors themselves who wrote this um, review in Trends in Ecology and Evolution say the triage is no more than the efficient allocation of conservation resources. <coughs> it's just the efficient allocation of resources. That's all it is. It's an economic cost-benefit analysis. But then they go on to say at the end of their paper, if doctors are willing to use triage and allocating resources to save human lives, why would conservation biologists be squeamish about doing the same? They're using this you know, very directly as a medical metaphor, <coughs> making the analogy that this is not optimization, it's not cost and be benefit analysis. They're using the word triage very deliberately to draw parallels between what doctors are do doing, life and death situations, and what we are being asked to do, letting species perhaps go extinct. And I call this the cloak of scientific respectability. Metaphors work because they affect the way we feel and think about the issue. They create a feeling in us. It's not just a word. Metaphors manipulate the emotions, the values, and decisions of the people who are hearing them. And this idea of whipping on a white lab coat and putting a stethoscope around us and saying, it's okay for us to let species go extinct because after all, doctors do that to people. But that's the conservation triage that's being practiced is not anything to do with what doctors do at all in, in uh, emergency rooms or on, or on battlefields. And it creates that sense of unquestionable scientific authority. But the average person hearing the word triage would say, well, oh, wow, that, they, they, without even thinking about it, go, oh, well, that's what doctors do, so therefore it's okay. And I think I can illustrate, illustrate the power of these metaphors by saying, be careful who you compare yourself to. If we compare ourselves to doctors, 
then we come out looking pretty good. But what we're actually doing is what economic, people in economics do, what politicians do. So I can take uh, this quote here, doctors are willing to use triage, then it's okay for us to do it. Well, let's try this one. If Stephen Harper is willing to use triage in allocating resources to science funding in Canada, then why would conservation biologists be so squeamish? The process is no different. Okay, so we're not doing what doctors do at all. And so we need to go back and rethink carefully these systems of value, how do we value species, how do we measure the costs and benefits, and how do we measure the probability of success. And are those mathematical and optimization models what we want to have lead us to decision making? It sounds objective, but it's not. It's a smoke screen. Let's get back to, to other kinds of, of triage. The, the conservation biology field likes to use the metaphor of battlefield triage because that's when you allow patients to die. You could save them if you had all the resources in the world, but you don't at that moment in time. Well, what about emergency rooms? That emergency rooms practice triage. Everybody who walks into an emergency room is triaged by the triage nurse. Uh, the difference is that in a hospital, all patients receive treatment at some point or another. You might have to wait a while, but if you go in there with a fever, you'll get treated eventually. It might take eight hours, but you'll get through. Uh, the most critically injured are always treated first. So in the sort of conservation world, that would mean endangered species are always treated first. And interestingly, once you walk through the doors of the hospital, you receive <coughs> almost unlimited medical care no matter what your condition. There is that mantra, let no person die. Right? And the resources, once you walk into that hospital, are unlimited, even if you don't have health insurance. Right? When you walk through that door, you get treated. Whether you need open heart surgery, CAT scans, you name it. Once you get through the doors, you will get that treatment. So if we want to use medical metaphors to engage the public and to guide our thinking, the battlefield triage metaphor is really not the one we want to be using. The other, pro the other problem, though, with this sort of uh, rela uh, relating conservation as sort of a crisis management emergency kind of situation is that it's not really an emergency in the sense that it's unexpected. So we go to emergency rooms because something has happened and you have to rush to the hospital by yourself or in an ambulance. Here's just one example from one of the birds I study, the poor wood thrush, kind of your poster bird for, for forest songbird declines. Um, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no sudden crisis for wood thrush. They've been declining since at least the 1960s. So we've had a 50-year uh, warning system. You know, even if you say, well, the breeding bird service from the breeding bird survey, well, let's say we wouldn't really know until the 1990s that, a, that a, a, de a serious decline is underway. We've still had at least 20 or 30 years of serious decline to get our act together and do something about it. And so in that sense, I think uh, the, the same thing is true for many endangered species, uh, that the writing has been on the wall for a long time, and it's really Comparing this, this kind of situation to an emergency room is also kind of misleading um, because we, it's, not, it's not about emergencies in this particular case. So I just want to um, conclude just by throwing it out there, and somebody mentioned this, I think, in the, uh, the round table this morning, um, that, I, that if we want to stick with medical metaphors, maybe we should go all the way and think about healthcare systems. Because we know when it comes to being cost-effective and business-like and saving money, that having a healthcare system in place where we have preventative medicine is way cheaper in the long run than allowing people to get sick and run off to the emergency room whenever they have an earache or something wrong with them. So putting a system in place where there's sufficient funding to, yes, save habitat, make sure we have safer pesticides and regulate them properly, invasive species control, all of this, if we have adequate funding for that, it will save money in the long run because we won't have species going to the emergency room. And so this is not a new idea at all, that, the, that we have to have this dual system. But I think it puts <coughs> conservation triage in its place where it belongs, which is down here as a last resort, rather than an overarching um, strategy for managing conservation biology in general. Oh, thanks, I'll be happy to take questions.
first. <laughs> you pick. You pick. You pick. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Isn't there another uh, risk within the metaphor of triage in the sense that it focuses on the uh, illness of the patient and figures the, the species as patients when in fact the real problem, as your slide points out there, is a problem of habitat. And the metaphor of triage and treatment and the patient makes it seem as if it's the patient, you know, who's failing to thrive. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it, it's a good question. Should we even refer to species out there as patients? Um, because that is another medical metaphor. I think in terms of looking at symptoms versus diseases versus treatments, the, the idea that you have a, a healthcare system in place, um, if we use that comparison, we certainly, when I go to the doctor, I'm considered a patient even if I'm, do, if I'm doing my annual checkup. And so uh, that sense where humans need to manage things, doctors need to manage their patients. And I think in that sense, there are parallels. Um, um, but particularly in terms of uh, trying to, try, I'm thinking on the fly here, but you can think of ways where you can educate people to assume healthier lifestyles so that they don't need to see the doctor so often, so that they don't get the diseases, you know, stop smoking and don't go to McDonald's so often. I think, I think we certainly have that role of managing habitats to provide that healthy, healthy environment with which these species need to thrive. I don't know if that answers your question, but I tried my best. Justina? What's a roping mic? <laughs> Is it already working? Okay, okay, fine. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, you articulated a lot of points that I've had an, an unease about the concept for a while, even though I, I believe in it, if you know what I mean, in the sense that we have to prioritize. When it, when it, when it starts to play out, uh, it gets a little bit problematic. And one thing I just wanted to comment on is, is your, your point about um, value seeping into to these various metrics in a seemingly objective equ equation. And another value that comes in a lot relates to costs. And where, where I've seen this happen in ver is opportunity costs. Um, and opportunity costs relate to what are, what are we giving up if we save the species, and, and even putting in uh, equations related to opportunity costs, i.e. how much oil and gas is, is, is in the land that you might otherwise save for that species. And, and that's been um, put into those equations to, to determine priority of which population of a particular species would be saved or, or which species. So I really appreciated those comments about uh, values. I don't know if you have any reaction to what I have to say about that. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I hadn't been aware, actually, that, that one way of um, assessing values is to look at the economic costs of saving a species in the sense that, um, that, if, you, that if you, yeah, well, you, well that, that, it's, that you're, there's lost costs elsewhere, and it just makes the, the sort of um, number keeping all the more complicated in the model, all, all the more difficult to arrive at something that's, that's really reliable. Uh, I think Kosiwik doesn't do that. Right? So you go, when you guys list a species, it's supposedly irrespective of how that listing will impact, um, you know, the the reaction of the minister and the economics of Canada and the, the different stakeholders. It's supposed to be stakeholder independent, for better or worse. Um, but yeah, in terms, in terms, as a scientist, the, the the most trouble I have with this approach to triage is putting in values because that's totally, completely subjective. Doesn't have to be. I mean, there are ways to we can measure aspects of biological systems that are quantitative and objective, but many of those values are not. And I think they're often what are used, and different groups would use different values, etc. That's that to me. That's the Achilles heel of this whole thing. I agree entirely that we need a prioritization system, and it can't be based solely on values and guesswork. There has to be some quantification behind it and some sort of modeling to arrive at good solutions. I'm all in favor of that. It's just not triage. I actually had two questions, but Justina nicely took one of them for me, so I only have one question now. Um, is there a danger? Uh, and uh, by the way, I want to say. I, 
totally agree with your talk, really, really perfect. Um, but is there a danger to pushing the analogy a little too far when we start saying that um, you know, triage, like medicine, we would provide emergency intensive care to critically endangered species and so on. You mentioned during your talk that when, once you get in the door of the hospital, they have a mantra of nobody dies, but we know that's not true. Uh, we have something called palliative care where people go to die with dignity and respect. Um, and I'm not saying I'm really comfortable with that, but uh, I would wonder if you have any thoughts on, on that particular aspect of the, of the analogy, if you well, I think one of the, I hope this is answering your question, but I think one of the most striking differences between a species and an individual is that individuals will always die. I am going to die, you're going to die, everybody in this room is going to die within a set time frame. Uh, and when it comes to species, as I showed with, it, with some of those last ditch efforts to save the condor and Vancouver Island marmot and that sort of thing, the lifespan of a species is very much in question and it's not inevitable that they're going to go extinct anytime soon. I know eventually in however many trillion years everything will be extinct, but at least in terms of evolution playing out uh, in its sort of normal way, if, there, if anything can be called normal, um, species don't die on a calendar basis even though we do. And so when it comes to that decision, should we be providing intensive care? If we have uh, the smarts to do it, the technology to do it, and the money to do it, my stand is that yes, we should, because species can last for millions of years. We know that. So who are we to pull the plug on a species because we can't be bothered to do it? Um, it's, I think that's the big difference between what we're talking about and palliative care. <coughs> palliative care um, it's the end result is absolutely inevitable for that individual and it's a matter of, you know, again, providing the person with comfort and dig dignity for them and their families. Um, first of all, let me say I just loved your talk. I thought it was intellectually very crisp and this has been a, a subject in which there has been far too much uh, confusion. Um, um, I think this issue of which you just mentioned is of you know, not letting species die um, is, 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 is of course vital, it's a vital distinction. Um, and the only thing I would have add, and I'll do it briefly because I made the point this morning, is, is we have really become good at not letting species die. Um, I mean, the techniques you talked about, the, the, I mean, the amazing amount of stuff that was learned with the California condor, that's often brought up in the United States as being an example of do we really want to spend, you know, five million dollars on one species? The reality is we've learned a huge amount by doing that. I mean, a huge amount of ecology, genetics, and behavior, and all the rest of it. And that's where there is this great analogy to medicine, that by the doctors, by refusing to let people die, um, you know, learn to do things that would have been possible. You look at how well premature babies survive now and how, you know, how premature they are now and survive and how, you know, how much of an improvement that has been made. So I think that, um, that is a, the, the one point that I would commend to you in, in a, at a superb presentation, that, that there's a benefit of doing this for what we know about our craft. I would add only that, uh, you know, in addition to what you're just saying, if we're going to weigh up costs and benefits and really do a full economic analysis, those transferable skills, like you were just mentioning, what we learn from it and how it benefits all the other species and how it saves us time and money in implementing recovery for other species, because we don't have to start from ground zero. We already know what to do with the turtles and the snakes, and we figured it out. And so if we can do our job of doing that kind of basic research and learning best practices, those are transferable to many other species, and so the cost should go down per species over time, just like it has in medicine. Our name is Dex. So, should we let designatable units die? So everyone's been talking about species as if there's some sort of real thing that is like an individual. I'm not sure it is. No, uh, I think we can go lower to levels of populations, which is what you're getting at, designatable units, genetically distinct populations. And again, when we're talking about how long does something last, when it comes to an individual, there's a birth and a death. But that's not true when we're talking about populations or any kind of evolutionary unit. Uh, 
individuals don't evolve, populations do. Dr. Steves was next there. And the microphone here. Thank you. Thanks so much for, for the talk. I just I just wanted to say that as a philosopher, it seems to me too that the, the point you make about metaphors is a really good one. And not only do they do they affect us because they manipulate our emotions or use our emotions, but it seems to me that the metaphors that we start thinking with are, is the way that we conceptualize the whole world then. And so you can't help but see the set of open, available possibilities to you based on the metaphor that you start with. And so often we don't even think about those metaphors, but they've already done all the work for us. Uh, so I think calling attention to that is a really great thing. And so I actually just wanted to be devil's advocate just a little bit here and to say, to say up front before I say it that I, I love polar bears and I love the fact that they're not cuddly. But what if someone were to say uh, on, on the issue of this palliative care um, that one, one reason that sometimes people are allowed to die, even in a hospital setting, is because the argument is made they're no longer really what they were before. That that's, that's not grandma there anymore and that the right thing to do would be to let whatever that is somehow pass. So uh, going along with some of the, the points that were made this morning, what if hypothetically it were the case that there is no habitat for the polar bear, that the only polar bears that are in existence are the ones in zoos? Could someone make the argument then, that's not a polar bear, that's something else because a polar bear is identified with its ecosystem, its relationships to other things, and now that's something else, and the respectful thing might be to let it die. I think when it, when it comes to threats to species, climate change is one that's putting us in a whole different category of the scale, the spatial scale of impact and the temporal scale of that impact. And I think that's a really good question because very few of us have conceived of a world where there's no Arctic habitat for polar bears to survive. Um, and I think it, the same might be true for other species that have uh, endemics and have really restricted ranges. I think we're more used to thinking about endemics going extinct because they occur on only one island, all the forest is being cut down. Uh, at least in that case, the, ha the environment hasn't changed so dramatically and there's still the prospect that maybe we can uh, put forests back on that island and let that zoo uh, species uh, release back into the wild in a period of 10, 20, 30 years. And I think the problem with the polar bear example is the time frame over which the species would be conservation reliant. It would be indefinite, wouldn't it, in, under your scenario? And in that case, I think it does, it would be very much like palliative care. <laughs> one last one here. Brett, can you pass the microphone to the lady? Yeah. Right. That's the last question. Um, so I actually just wanted to maybe question the claim that you had made about um, sort of removing values um, from these like this decision process. Um, and the reason I would like to do that is because even if you eliminate um, the sort of value-laden selection process of which species are going to be, oops, sorry, given most priority, um, deciding that conservation biology, for example, has the right data and the relevant data um, to be the one to make that decision, to make that call, also sort of implies some sort of um, normative um, weight or normative precedence for conservation biology as opposed to ecology or, um, I don't know, politics or whatever. So um, I would just like to hear if you could speak to, to that. I guess, you know, well, one could say, well, who should decide uh, the triage system in terms of uh, determining prioritization. Uh, and you know, speaking as a scientist, I'm used to thinking in terms of population sizes and survival rates and demography and being able to predict population projections and, and do research on threats and, and, and do it numerically. So that certainly is my leaning. Uh, if we threw all that all, out, the, that all out and decided instead we would just go onto social media and let the public choose, as a, as a op totally opposite extreme, that would be another way of doing this, is to say, let's let people vote, you know, like, like as a reality show or something, but vote for your favorite species, and that's the one that gets saved. So I'm, I'm throwing that out there not as a real suggestion, of course, but just to show the extremes and approaches, and one of the really rewarding things about this symposium has been um, being able to see 
all the different approaches and ideas that go into conservation, which as a field is broader, of course, than just science. Uh, I can't imagine a world where we just let people vote for their favorite species and, and, and save those, but maybe other people can't imagine a world where scientists tell us you know, which one we think is, is the best one to choose. <coughs> there. Let's thank Bridget again.